bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we ask for your blessing on every person in this room. We give you thanks for everything you've done for every person in this room. Without you, this moment would not be possible. We bow in humble reverence to you, and we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the people you have brought in our lives that have allowed this moment to be possible. We give you thanks for the founders of this great college. We give you thanks for people who support it. We give you thanks for everything that's good. Bless every graduate's heart. May they hear your voice. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Be seated. Here's some really good words from Proverbs 3. My child, don't forget what I teach you. Always remember what I tell you to do. My teaching will give you a long and prosperous life. Never let go of loyalty and faithfulness. Tie them around your neck, like one heart. If you do this, both God and people will be pleased with you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Never rely on what you think you know. Remember the Lord in everything you do, and He will show you the right way. Never let yourself think that you are wiser than you are. Simply obey the Lord and refuse to be alone. If you do, it will be like good medicine, healing your wounds and easing your pains. Honor the Lord by making Him an offering from the best of all that your land produces. If you do, your barns will be filled with grain, and you will have too much wine to store in it. My child, when the Lord corrects you, you pay close attention and take it as a warning. The Lord corrects those He loves as parents correct a child with whom they are proud. Happy is anyone who becomes wise, who comes to have an understanding. There's more profit in it than there is in silver. It is worth more to you than gold. Wisdom is more valuable than jewels. Nothing you can want can compare with it. Wisdom offers you a long life as well as health, wealth, and honor. Wisdom can make your life pleasant and lead you safely through it. Those who become happy and wise are happy. Wisdom will give them life. The Lord created the earth by His wisdom, by His knowledge set, He set the sky in place. His wisdom caused the rivers to flow and the clouds to give rain to the earth. A child hold on to your wisdom and insight. Never let them get away from you. They will provide you with life, a pleasant and happy life. You can go safely on your way and never even stumble. You will not be afraid when you go to bed, and you will sleep soundly through the night. You will not have to worry about sudden disasters such as come on the wicked like a storm. The Lord will keep you safe. He will not let you fall into a trap. When you possibly can, do good to those who need it. Never tell your neighbors to wait until tomorrow if you can help them now. Don't plan anything that will hurt your neighbors. They live beside you, trusting you. Don't argue with others for no reason when they have never done you any harm. Don't be jealous of violent people who decide to act as they do. Because the Lord hates people who do evil. But he takes righteous people into his confidence. The Lord puts a curse on the homes of the wicked but blesses the homes of the righteous. He is no use for conceited people but shows favor to those who are humble. Wise people will gain an honorable reputation, but stupid people will only add to their own disgrace. It is my honor to welcome you to the 2019 graduation at York College. We're excited that you're here. There are a few introductions that I, and comments that I want to make before I introduce our speaker. 
First of all, if you are the parent of one of our graduates, would you please stand at this point?
as a preacher, as an author, also as a person who has uh, worked with over 600 executives in coaching and mentoring, mentoring leadership skills, un uniquely qualifies him to advise us on, on the kind of lives we need to lead and the kind of things that should be important as we go forward. But more than that, uh, Dr. Mike Armour uh, has been a president of a college before and he's worked in higher education. And early in, in my tenure here at York College, he has been instrumental in giving me advice uh, when I have problems. Uh, when I was in the Dallas area, I just, uh, we'd go have lunch together and he would give me some advice or I could call him at any time. And he would, uh, he would give me some wisdom. He's a very wise man very learned man, but more than that, he's a humble man, and he is a phenomenal Christian who serves his Lord. And so I would like you to welcome to the podium, Dr. Mike Harmon. Thank you, Dr. Ekman. And may I add my commendation and compliments to this wonderful graduating class for attaining this milestone in your careers. I count it a distinct privilege and honor to be invited to speak on this occasion before the members of a student body, a faculty, and an administration, which I admire so greatly. And I want to use my few moments with you today to zero in on two themes, pep talks and heroes. This graduating class knows a lot about the pep talks. The majority of you have been student athletes, so you've heard no small number of pep talks during your time on this campus. Some of them perhaps in this very facility. In my youth, I heard a lot of pep talks too. But one stands out from all the others. It was delivered on a frigid December evening at halftime in an equally frigid locker room. Recently I had a chance to revisit that pep talk because the man who delivered it, Charlie Lyles, my high school basketball coach, is still in good enough health that he was able to join us last year for a class reunion. As he and I were visiting about the old days, I reminded him of that pep talk. We had driven two hours to a tiny town with a ramshackle gymnasium built in the 1930s. Five minutes into our pregame warm-up, the heating system in the entire building went out. The coaches of the two teams must have been sadistic because they decided to go ahead with the game anyway. But every time fans would enter the building, the doors would open and the freezing cold air from outside, where it was about 16 degrees, would flood across the floor. And by the time we got to the tip-off, the temperature on the court was in the 40s and dropping quickly. By the second quarter, the reserves sitting on the, on the bench were shivering, their legs and their arms turning blue. And those of us on the court weren't doing much better, but at least we were running and we could generate some body heat to, set off, uh, to offset the temperature. But it was so cold that as the point guard, I would bring the ball down court, set the offense, pass the ball off, and then pray, Lord, don't let anyone pass it back to me. <laughs> it hurt so much just to catch that now rock-hard ball. And if you did get a chance to shoot, there was no touch on your shot. It was like you had a board on the end of your arm instead of a functional part of your body. The only thing that saved us was that the other team was equally miserable. And at halftime, the score was six to six. 
As soon as the buzzer sounded for halftime, we galloped to the dressing room, thinking surely it will be a little bit warmer. And it was, but not much. We ran to our lockers and grabbed our jackets and got in them, hoping to, to break the chill just a little bit. Meanwhile, Coach Lyles lagged behind. Now, I should tell you that he was a bulk of a man. He had been an All-American fullback, and he could bench press more weight than any of us thought possible. We were somewhat awestruck with the man's strength. Finally, he came in, stood quietly for quite a period of time, and then in very low, measured tones, said, gentlemen, I know it's cold out there. But if I don't see more performance out of you the second half than I saw the first half, it will be a long, long time before you're ever cold again. And he turned and walked out. We sat there staring at one another, asking, well, what did that mean? But we quickly decided none of us wanted to find out. And so we threw off our jackets, dashed out on the floor, and tried to figure out a way to, to make our shot freezing hands or not. And I guess it worked. We ended up coming out 36 to 8 when the final buzzer went off. But that, li that night, I learned something about pep talks. They don't have to be allowed. They don't have to be animated. They don't have to be long in order to give us the inspiration we need at the moment. So one of the things I want to leave you with today is a pep talk that I think can serve us all well through life. It certainly has been helpful to me. Because there will be other times when the challenge we face is just as complex and just as daunting and just as discomforting as that frigid basketball court. But we don't have a Charlie Lyles around us to give us the pep talk we need at that moment. We have to muster some self-talk that gets us back into the game the way we need to be playing the game. And I'm going to share with you a pep talk that I derived from one of my heroes. I wish I could tell you this man's name. Unfortunately, we don't know it. We don't know when he lived. We don't know where he lived. We're not even sure that he ever lived at all. Everything we know about him is contained in two verses in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus in that section of the gospel, is giving a series of metaphors to his disciples to explain what the kingdom of God is like. And at the 44th verse, he says, the kingdom of heaven is, is like a merchant searching for fine pearls, who, when he found one of great value, sold everything he had, and he purchased it. In that man's example, there are three words that form the pep talk I want to leave with you. The first of those is purpose. This man had a clear and distinctive sense of purpose. He knew what he was doing, where he was going in pursuit of that desire, and what it was going to take for him to get there. One of the reasons Jesus compared him to the kingdom of heaven 
is because we serve a God of purpose. The pearl merchant wasn't simply window shopping. He wasn't wandering through one bazaar after another, looking here and there as he went from marketplace to marketplace. He was acting with purpose and design. And scripture affirms time and time again that that's the kind of God that we serve. Although the Romans God works all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. He told the Ephesians in chapter 1 that we have received an eternal inheritance through the purpose that God has in place. And in the third chapter of Ephesians, he speaks of this as being God's eternal purpose. And the word eternal in the phrase in Greek is the word that gives us our word eons. It is the theme that God has been working out through the ages. He's not just stumbling along through history, making it up as things unfold. And he designed us to be a people who live life with a sense of meaning and purpose. Unfortunately, millions of people today in this very country and certainly around the globe do not have that core sense of meaning in their life. Our suicide rate is skyrocketing. These are the people of whom Carl Jung spoke late in his life. Jung was the second most influential thinker in the early history of psychiatry. And as he brought his career to an end, he looked back and observed that fully two-thirds of the people who came to him for therapy were not suffering from any diagnosable neurotic or psychotic condition. They were simply struggling with an absence of meaning at the core of their existence. And without that sense of purpose and meaning, they were left with nothing but an existential emptiness. There was a young cohort in the field of European psychology, or psychiatry at the time who would come to understand that phenomenon even better than you. His name was Viktor Frankl. Frankl is another of my heroes. In high school I read his best-selling book, Man's Search for Meaning. And what I found in those pages not only arrested my attention, it has shaped my life all these many years. Frumbel, while still a teenager, right after the end of the First World War, caught the attention of Sigmund Freud, who brought him to Vienna and took him under wing as a personal protege. By 30, he was an established psychiatrist with a national reputation in Austria. But he was Jewish. And when the Nazis came to power, Frankel and his family were rounded up and hauled off to a concentration camp. His parents would die in prison. His wife, all of his family except for one sister. Frankel himself was spared execution because he had his training as a medical doctor before he became a psychiatrist. And so the Nazis allowed him to practice a rudimentary form of bedside manner in the camps. He would be moved to four camps before it was over, including the famous death camp at Auschwitz. But though he was tending to people daily, the Nazis gave him virtually no medicine for the sick and the dying. Maybe a few aspirin, that was about the most he ever had. So all he could do was offer counsel and comfort to the suffering. Over the course of the war, he therefore watched thousands of people die. But there was something that struck him as being extraordinary. 
with all of that death going on in the camp, there were a few people, a handful of people, whose health was not particularly good, whose bodies were quite frail with malnutrition, but they just kept hanging on and on. Others who would come into the camp relatively healthy would go over and sit down and sit, seem to just will themselves to death. They would be gone in just a matter of days. But these people found a way to keep thriving no matter what the circumstances. And Frankel said, what is the difference? And he finally concluded that the thing that set these people apart is that they had a deep sense of purpose and meaning in their life. They had a why to outlast this thing. They had to outlast it because of that thing that was so important to them. They had to get back to it. And Frankl would often think in his imprisonment about the words of the 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche who said, if you will give a man a compelling why, he can bear with unthinkable howls. I was reminded of those words quite often in the spring of 1973. The Vietnam War had just finished. Our prisoners were finally coming home. And as a young intelligence officer, I was assigned to one of the teams to debrief seven of the POWs returning from Hanoi. Most of these men had been in solitary confinement for six to seven years. And during that time, tortured horrendously, sometimes on a daily basis. We were capturing their stories so we could learn their secrets of survival, to teach future generations of sailors and airmen and infantrymen and marines who might face imprisonment themselves to help them get ready for it. And so we were gathering their stories in detail, sickening detail, stomach-turning detail. And when you would hear them recounting these episodes, you could not help but ask with something like that. But when we ask that question, we always got an immediate response. They could tell us why they had to do it. Give a man a compelling why, and he can endure and outlast unthinkable hows. After the war was over, Franco developed a whole new field of therapy called logotherapy, very popular in Europe, never made many inroads in the U.S. But the whole purpose of this therapy is to help people rediscover the meaning that can give them purpose in life. And he not only wrote about that, he believed in it assiduously. When he was in his 90s, I learned that he was going to be speaking on the campus of Southern Methodist University, which is only about five to ten minutes from my house. And so I pulled every string I could pull to get one of the limited seats in the house that night. It was one of the most memorable nights of my life. For two hours, without a note, animated, moving from one side of the stage to the other, he gave us an overview of the history of psychiatry in which he integrated many competing views of psychiatry to show us that they were not really competing at all, but just looking at a different facet of human existence. And after two hours of speaking, he opened the floor for questions. A, a woman down front said, Dr. Frankel, are you still working? He said, oh yeah, yeah. What do you do, she said. Uh, I work for the state of Austria. I go around to psychiatric institutions where people have been hospitalized because they are a threat to take their life. 
And my job is to determine whether they're ready to be released or not. Oh, someone said, that must be very difficult. <laughs> not at all, he shrugged. I can do it in about 20 seconds. <laughs> yes, went up to the audience. You can make a pivotal decision like that in 20 seconds? Oh, yes, he said. You see, they know why I'm there. And so when they come in, I get up and I walk across the room, I hold out my hand, and I say, I'm Dr. Victor Frankel. I'm here to make an assessment of you. See, it's time for you to leave this place. And I motion them to a chair. And as they get seated, and I'm in the process of getting my seat, I, I walk a bit slowly, and I say to them as I'm walking, so tell me, are you still thinking about killing yourself? He said, I know at that point the answer will be no. Because if they're not thinking about killing themselves, they'll say no. But if they are thinking about killing themselves, they know if they say yes, I'm not going to let them go, so they're going to say no. So I know I'm going to get the answer no, but I time it so that just as they finish the word no, I'm sitting down eye to eye with them, and I look them straight in the eye and I say, why not? And the ones who are ready to go can tell me, why not? They have a why to survive. And if they've not yet found that, they are not ready to go. So how do you find the purpose for your life? I wish I could point you to Frontal's book, but being an atheist, I think some of his solutions are not well advised. But let me tell you about where I think you find it you pay close attention to those moments in your life that are most fulfilling and which resonate most deeply within you. One of my mentors used to say, if you can find the place where your passion and your compassion intersect, you're very close to where the purpose for your life is to be found. So pay close attention. When are the times that I feel most alive? What are the things I'm doing when it, when it seems that time just almost disappears because it's so engrossing and engaging for me? And over a period of time, gather those stories, those anecdotes in your storehouse of memories, and then take the time periodically to sit back and say, what's the common theme in all of those? It took me years to do it. I finally came to realize that the way the Lord had uniquely gifted me and, and structured my inner being, that my purpose was helping people succeed by giving them insight and clarity. And as I look back, everything I did did in higher education, everything I did in ministry, everything I'm doing now as a leadership coach, working with leaders around the globe, even many of the briefings I delivered in my intelligence career were aimed at helping people succeed by giving them clarity and insight. Now that may not be your purpose at all. But once I was clear as to what mine was, it became real easy to say no to other things. It allowed me to become focused, to spend my time doing the kinds of things that would excite me and you every day. And that's what I long for you to experience. Don't feel that I'm telling you you should do this tomorrow. I'm simply saying leave here as an observer of your own reaction to life and little by little get clearer as time goes by on what it is that gives your life meaning. God has created us so that we need meaning in order to be fully at peace with the world. He has programmed us to ask why. Any of us who've ever had a two-year-old 
know that there's a stage of childhood development at which they drive us absolutely crazy with the incessant, why? Why? But we never stop asking that question. Unlike the other animate creatures of this planet, when things don't make sense to us, it bothers us. In the business world, probably the most widely followed contemporary business writer is Simon Sinek, whose book is entitled, Start With Why. Michael uh, Hyatt, former CEO of uh, one of our major publishing houses, Thomas Nelson, and now one of the top leadership consultants in the world, frequently says to his office, uh, uh, audiences, when you lose your why, you lose your way. So find your why and keep coming back to it. Now I spent the bulk of my time on that first word because it is so foundational. If we don't get it right, the other two are pointless. But let me quickly touch on them. The second characteristic of this hero called the male pearl merchant is that he had a quest for excellence. He wasn't just looking for pearls. He was looking for particularly fine pearls. And if we understand God's purpose for us in the largest sense of life, and in the more particular sense of our personal day-to-day -day existence, we will by nature become people who demand excellence of ourselves. Because that's why God created us the way He did. In 2 Peter, the writer describes our identity in Jesus. We are a, a royal priesthood, he said. We're a holy nation. We're a people for God's own possession. And then he explains why we have that identity. In order, he said, that we may declare the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The reality is we are called to help the world see the excellence of God through us. And the name of Christ and the kingdom of heaven were never enlarged in people's imagination because Christians settled for mediocrity. To serve a God who made us with a quest for excellence in our bosom. We need to live up to the way we were designed. And so, Paul tells the Philippians, you need to add some other things to your faith. First, add excellence. The same word used in 2 Peter 1. And yet, as I consult with large corporations and startups, in settings where they want me to help them identify and clarify their core values, that word excellence gets kicked around a lot. Everybody seems to want excellence as one of their core values. But I ask you, if all the corporations in America have excellence as a core value, why do we have so, mediocre, so many mediocre companies? Well, I put that question to one of my clients in Indiana about three years ago. I had just helped this little manufacturing company clarify its values. And excellence was one of the values they insisted on having in the list. And I said, that same thing. Well, if you're in such a quest for excellence, why have you been doing so mediocre all these years? And one of them very astutely said, because we don't know how to operationalize it. We don't know how to take that fine-sounding word and turn it into actual items every day. And so I said, well, then how would we do that? And they began to add ideas around. The CEO, who was sitting right to my side, and is a very introspective and introverted man, said nothing during this, and finally he spoke up. 
And he said, excellence is about four things. Doing it better today than we did it yesterday. Doing it better today than we ever did it before. Doing it better today than our competition thinks possible. And doing it better today than we once thought possible ourselves. I don't know any better way to operationalize it. Whatever that is that you commit your life to, wherever you find that purpose and meaning and direction, every day do it better than you did the day before. Better than you've ever done it before. Better than your colleagues think possible. Better than you once thought possible yourself. Add to your faith excellence. And the final thing about this man, my hero, the Pearl Merchant, is that he was a man of very clear priorities. When he found that pearl of exquisite value, he immediately sold everything he had in order to buy it. One of the things you've been studying in many of your classes here at the college is how to find solutions to problems. But there's something that's important for us to understand about solutions. Thomas Sowell, one of my favorite contemporary writers, words it very well. He says, ultimately, there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. Every solution we say yes to, we say no to something else. So every solution is a trade-off. The pearl merchant could make his trade-off because he had thought through clearly what it was he wanted to accomplish. And he was prepared to approach it with the priority of valuing this thing above all else that he had. Being clear on our priorities so that we can manage those moments of trade-off adroitly will be one of the greatest secrets for your future success. Peter Drucker, the most influential management thinker in the history of the United States, maybe the world, used to say, don't talk about prioritizing your schedule. Talk about scheduling your priorities. When you're clear on your purpose and you're committed to pursue it with excellence, that then leads you naturally to a certain set of logical priorities. Be sure those things are scheduled first. Pursue them relentlessly. Purpose, excellence, priorities. It doesn't have to be very long, this pep talk. Purpose, excellence, priorities. P, E, P. It has been my experience that when I'm floundering, when my company is not doing as well as I think it should, when my clients are struggling and unable to accomplish what surely seems within their grasp. We can come back to those three words and usually find the culprit in one of them. We've either lost our passion for our purpose, or we've been compromising on our pursuit of excellence, or we have been confused in our priorities and paralyzed by deciding how to make the trade-offs. It's a shorter pep talk than even Charlie Lyle's. But Charlie Lyles won't be with me every time I need that reminder of what it is I need to be about in the next period of time. But I can all remember purpose, excellence, priorities. And if you will make it a habit to do that, it's the only pep talk you will ever need. God bless you.
graduation exercises always include recognitions and honors. After all, that's why so many of you have traveled to be here today. And it's proper and fitting that we uh, pause at this time and uh, recognize some of our uh, individuals that we would uh, that are noteworthy and that we'd like to uh, take time to uh, give special recognition to this morning. First, I'd like to recognize the academic achievements of some of our baccalaureate graduates. You may note that some are wearing honor medallions. These medallions are inscribed with the college seal on the obverse and include the mission statement on the reverse. Those graduating cum laude are signified with a white ribbon. Those graduating magna cum laude are signified with a blue ribbon. And those graduating summa cum laude are signified with both a blue and white ribbon. For those graduates wearing honor medallions, would you please stand right now and let us recognize you. given by York College annually to a graduating senior based on scholarship, leadership, and maturity. Students are nominated by faculty members and chosen by the provost. Nominees are considered on the basis of the following criteria, a GPA of 3.0 or higher. They're serious and well-rounded student academically. They support the ideals and goals of York College. They're involved in school and community activities. Uh, we have witnessed and seen spiritual, social, and emotional maturity in them in their time here. And we also look at them in terms of their relationships with both peers and the faculty. This year's recipient is a serious student who excels in her coursework and has modeled in maturity and consistency in her studies. She's remained focused on career goals during their time here. And this student consistently goes beyond, uh, works to go beyond the basic requirement and seeks a deeper understanding uh, of our course material. She's a competitive student, but in the true spirit of intellectual inquiry, she encourages her classmates to excel and do better as well. Faculty appreciate the student's dedication to learning and her spirit. During her time here, she's grown tremendously as a person. She's been involved in things such as campus ministries and served as a community assistant in the apartments. And although quiet and oftentimes overlooked, the growth and maturation of this individual is an example of the transformation we strive for here at North College. She's an accomplished student who has developed intellectually, socially, and spiritually. She serves as an admirable model for her peers. She loves York College and consistently supports our institutional mission. So this morning, I am pleased to announce the 2019 York College Dean's Award recipient is Ms. Michaela Wilson. of Achievement Award is given by York College annually to a full-time faculty member who has made outstanding contributions to York College. They're nominated by other faculty members selected by a committee of previous Larson Award recipients and are considered on the basis of the following criteria. Excellence of teaching or membership and, and participation in learned or professional societies. Service to the institution. Spiritual commitment. Attitudes displayed in the working environment at York College and a dedication to York College as demonstrated in activities beyond the classroom. In addition to recognition, the recipient receives a plaque and medallion that becomes part of the academic regalia and cash award. And this year's recipient is someone who teaches with passion, is well liked by our students and respected by their peers. This person is dedicated to the spiritual and relational development of students investing time in many of our students through one-on-one -on -one relationships and working with students outside the classroom and sometimes outside the country on mission trips. 
This individual is a strong supporter of York College who exudes a positive attitude. It is not uncommon to hear whistling coming from this person's office. This person's recipient has played a foundational role in the York College Second Chance Program at the Nebraska Correctional Center for Women. It is my privilege to present this year's Dale R. Larson Teacher of Achievement Award to Dr. Terry Seiferlein. Candidates for the master degree, please rise. <clears throat> President Ekman, records having been certified that these students have met the requirements stated for graduation, I now present to you the candidates for the master degree. <clears throat> candidates, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, I now confer upon you the master degree with all honors, rights, and privileges associated with that degree. Congratulations. <laughs> Would the candidates for the baccalaureate degree please rise? certified that these students have met the requirements stated for graduation, I now present to you the candidates for the baccalaureate degree. <laughs> candidates, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, I now confer upon you the baccalaureate degree with all honors, rights, and privileges associated with that degree. Congratulations. You may be seated. At this time, graduates will, will be presented with their diplomas. Names of graduates not in attendance will be read. Uh, not be read. Excuse me. Dwayne Lyle Barker, organizational and global leadership. After graduation, um, Dwayne plans to begin and continue working at Kimray Oil and Gas and Management. <laughs> Seth Bearden, Organizational and Global Leadership. After graduation, he will continue working at Kimray Oil and Gas and Information Technology. Anita Lurleen Palmer, Curriculum and Instruction. After graduation, she will continue working at Buffalo Jones Elementary School in Garden City, Kansas. <laughs> Samantha Adami, Criminal Justice. After graduation, Sam plans to go back to California. <laughs> Katie Bell, Criminal Justice and Psychology, graduating magna cum laude. After graduation, um, Katie will eventually uh, attend graduate school sometime in the future and will begin working at Upworth Village in New York. Joshua S. Berte, Business Administration. After graduation, Josh will begin working at a management position in Bakersfield, California. Isaiah Kevon Jamal Bond. After graduation, Isaiah will begin working as a personal trainer in San Francisco, California.
Trey Michael Bradley, Business Administration, graduating summa cum laude. After graduation, Trey plans to attend graduate school here at York College. Nick Anthony Brown, Psychology. After graduation, Nick plans to attend graduation school at Southern of New Orleans and begin working at 360 Mental Health in New Iberia, Louisiana. Shania Jo Brown, Education. After graduation, Shania will begin working at Westridge Middle School in Grant Island, Nebraska as an 8th grade resource teacher. Patrick Lavon Burnett, Psychology. After graduation, time will only tell what Pat will do. Caleb Zachary Cardwell, Business Administration. After graduation, Caleb will begin working at Cornerstone Bank here in New York. Natalie Carrasco, Biology. <laughs> Melody K. Kuhorn, Psychology. After graduation, Melody will continue working at CASA, CASA for York County. Asa J. Coppinger, Communication, graduating summa cum laude. After graduation, Asa will continue his videography career working for Lord Dixon. William Billy John Damon, General Studies. After graduation, Billy will be playing independent baseball in California. Mark D. Jr., Sports Management. After graduation, Mark will be starting his own business in Colorado. <laughs> Ashley Yvonne Dugan, Biology, with a minor in Psychology. After graduation, Ashley will attend graduate school at the University of South Florida. Justin M. Dyer, Biology, graduating cum laude. After graduation, Justin will begin working as a lab technician in Topeka, Kansas. <laughs> Deidre Leanne Freitas, Communication, graduating summa cum laude. After graduation, Deidre will be attending graduate school at the University of Essex to receive Receive a MFA in directing. <laughs> Kelly from Sports Management. After graduation, Kelly will begin working at Seattle Select in Shoreline, Washington. Courtney Lynn Gibbs, Accounting, graduating Magna Cum Laude. After graduation, Courtney will be attending graduate school at Oklahoma Christian University. <laughs> Ernest E. Green IV, Business Administration. After graduation, Ernest will begin working at the University City Police Department in University City, Missouri. Grace Harrington, Psychology. After graduation, Kathy will begin working at the Youth Rehabilitation and Treatment Center in Geneva, Nebraska. Ryan G. Harrison, Communication. After graduation, 
graduation, Ryan will be going to graduate school here at York College and begin working as a GA. Brennan Jarvis, Business Administration. After graduation, Brennan will continue working in San Diego. Madison Kinney, Education, graduating summa cum laude. After graduation, Maddie will begin working at Council Bluffs Community Schools and Elementary PE. Bryce Matthew Kinsey, Criminal Justice, graduating cum laude. After graduation, Bryce will begin working at the FBI Academy in Monaco, Virginia. Deborah Kurtzer, Business Administration, graduating summa cum laude. After graduation, Deborah will begin working at Blue Beacon here in New York. Laura Leos, Psychology. After graduation, Laura will attend graduate school at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Jacob Hayden Lorenz, Business Administration. After graduation, Jake will begin working at OCB Plumbing and building his personal training company, Brain Gains, in both Omaha and New York. Clay Luby, Sports Management, graduating magna cum laude. March, Business Administration, graduating magna cum laude. After graduation, Zach will begin working at 49 Financial in Austin, Texas. Conrad Morris, Biology. After graduation, Conrad will begin working at Farmer's Edge in Grand Island. DeAndre Nero, Sports Management. After graduation, DeAndre will continue working at the kitchen in management and building his resume. Dylan Odom, Sports Management. After graduation, Dylan will continue his education here at grad school at York College. Mateus Paiva Horto, Zane Fow, Sports Management. After graduation, Zane will continue his education here at grad school at York College. Ashley Yasmin Rinden, Criminal Justice and Psychology. After graduation, Ashley will begin working as a behavioral therapist in Los Angeles, California. Alicia Rodriguez, Criminal Justice with a minor in Psychology, graduating magna cum laude. After graduation, she will head back to California. Trier Ham, Sports Management. After graduation, Alan will begin continue working at Orchland Farm and Home until his wedding is over. <laughs> Gabrielle Kathleen 
hasn't seen in all art, education, and voice performance. After graduation, Gabby will begin working at Meridian Public Schools in Dakin, Nebraska as a 4th through 12th grade vocal music teacher. Christopher Smith, Jim yes. After graduation, Chris will begin working at York College uh, as the head assistant coach for the women's basketball team. <laughs> Lamar L. Smith, business administration. After graduation, Lamar will start his own business in Nevada. Adriana C. Sotolongo, criminal justice. After graduation, Dree will begin working here at York College in the admissions office. <laughs> Kelsey Lynn Sweet, education, graduating summa cum laude. After graduation, Kelsey will be getting married and warming up in Texas. Connor Madison Toll, accounting, graduating summa cum laude. After graduation, Connor will begin working at Waste Connections in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Travis L. Turner, biology. After graduation, graduation Travis will attend graduate school at Creighton University. Valentine Communication. Alec B. Venegas, Sports Management, graduating cum laude. After graduation, Alec will begin working and coaching back in Oklahoma. David Brett Vidal, Sports Management. After graduation, DB will begin working in the electrical field and start coaching in California. Erin Rebecca Walgren, General Studies, graduating cum laude. After graduation, Erin is going on the York College Study Abroad trip and plans to have the time of her life uh, before transitioning back into adulthood. Again, congratulate all of our graduates. <laughs> At this time, will all master degree recipients and their escorts please stand. The honored escorts are asked to accompany the graduate to the stage and with the dean of, of the graduate college, place the hood signifying the student's academic accomplishments over the shoulders of the graduate. Your college is proud of each of you and your accomplishments, and we congratulate you on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the administration and the faculty of York College.
Come on. This time, with all bachelor degree recipients and their honored escorts, please stand. The honored escorts are asked to place the hood, signifying the student's academic accomplishments, over the shoulders of the graduate. York College is proud of each of you and your accomplishments, and we congratulate you on behalf of the Board of Trustees, and the administration, and the faculty of York College.
this year's 2019 North High graduates. Please remain standing as the uh, stage party exits at this time. <laughs> 